Welcome once again to Sharing Socks. I'm uh, Southside Sox duty geezer Lee Allen. With me, my son and uh, West Coast correspondent Will, and with us a very special guest. We are sharing multicolored socks uh, today because our guest, while a longtime professor at the University of Illinois, is a New England native and a lifelong fan of those other socks. So we have a little red bleed in coming today, even though I was born in Boston and knew better to, than to stay with that team when I moved to Chicago. Our guest is Dr. Alan Nathan, Professor Emeritus of Physics at the University of Illinois. And by virtually every source I've seen, the foremost expert on the physics of baseball that there is. Recipient this year of the Henry Chadwick Award for contributions to baseball that's put out by the Saber folks. And uh, also a consultant to Major League Baseball, much uh, sourced on anything and everything. And uh, Alan, we really appreciate uh, you coming on and uh, yeah, it's raising the level beyond two guys blathering and pretending they know what they're talking about. It's nice to have somebody who actually does. But uh, we're going to talk, I initially, when I, when I first contacted Alan, I wanted to talk about the baseball itself and what could be done there to get rid of the three true outcomes thing that we've wandered into and get back into people running around bases. Um, but since then, an elephant has entered the room and that obviously is spin rates, doctoring of baseballs and everything that goes along with that. So we're gonna talk about spin rates first. We're gonna to get to the baseball later. We're going to get to Allen's cure uh, for baseball if there is one within the, the realm of the physics or, or anything else that he finds of the proper realm. We're going to start out with spin rates, and you know, can you expect the kind of basic? I and mean, we know you spin a baseball, and, and and it can move, and everybody learns that when they're very young. But uh, things like Magnus Force. Every time I say that, I, I think of Clint Eastwood. But Magnus Force Bauer units. Uh, what we have gotten into by going from just hey, you got to spin the ball to curve it, to the incredible scientific nature that exists right now. Can can you take us through that in in, in a layman's way uh you mean specifically about the the movement on the pitch uh, yeah the, yeah what, what's what spin rates are doing and how yeah okay so yeah so uh uh when the ball moves through the air it, it experiences uh various forces on it and the most simple of, of which is just simply gravity which is always pulling it down but in addition it, it it has forces on it due to the fact that it's moving through the air and one of those forces is what's known as air drag or air resistance, which slows the ball down, but doesn't change its direction. It slows it down. So for example, um, a 95 mile per hour fastball at release by the time it crosses home plate is probably only going about 87, 86 miles an hour. So it loses speed that way as it collides with air molecules. Uh, but the, for, the, for present purposes, the more important uh, of these forces is what is known as the Magnus force. It's, it's the force on a spinning baseball. And uh, it's what makes the curveball curve. But it, I mean, literally, all, virtually all pitches, except knuckleballs, have spin on them. And the movement, uh, the amount of movement depends on the spin rate, the number of revolutions per minute, or RPM. And the direction of the movement primarily depends on what is called the spin axis. So uh, I get a little baseball here as a demo. So if the ball is coming at you and it has backspin on it, well, so let me let me just back up a second. If you want to know the direction of the movement due to the spin, it, you look at the leading edge of the ball that's coming at you, and the way that ball is turning, the direction of that ball is turning is the direction of that so-called Magnus force, and which will be the direction of the movement. So a four-seam fastball coming at you, uh, notice that the uh, it has backspin on it and the front of the ball is moving upward and that's the direction of the movement. It basically is opposing gravity. And nowadays pitchers, uh, the mon mantra among pitches is when you're throwing a four-seam fastball, you want a lot of spin on it so the ball is sort of high in the zone, okay? The sort of the opposite would be the curveball, which primarily has topspin. 
And so you see the front of the ball is moving down and that's the direction of the movement. So whereas a four seam fastball doesn't drop as much as it would just from gravity, a uh, curveball drops more than you would get, guess just from gravity alone. And so, you know, keeping the fastball up and the curveball down, that's sort of what pitches are trying to do these days. And then, you know, there's, you could have the ball spinning sideways uh, and all kinds of different orientations in between. So that's sort of the basic thing. Uh, the, the batter, the pitcher is trying to confuse the batter by, uh, by having the ball move in different directions. And that movement direction is largely controlled, not entirely, but largely controlled by the way, by the so-called spin axis, the way that the axis about which the ball is spinning. Of course, we're now in the great controversy of the use of sticky stuff so that pitchers can get a stronger grip, which at least in theory allows them to put in more spins. And we're talking over 2000 revolutions a minute basically and out of good, most good pitchers are going to be, gets up to 2,500 or so, I guess, in some things. Will and I have ignorantly in the past said, well, this is going to affect the guys with their sliders and their curveballs. But as I read your papers, I came to understand that's not true, that the biggest effect of spin rate is on four seam fastballs up in the zone. And that's what's been devastating with the increase of the spider attack and the other gun. Am I accurate in that? Yeah, you most certainly are. Yes. Yeah. And uh, so uh, the, the sticky stuff on the ball, whatever it may be, um, as you point out, it allows the batter, to, the pitcher to get a more spin on the ball. I mean, technically what's going on here, if you want to talk physics a little bit, you're actually increasing the friction between the fingers and the surface of the ball. It's that friction that allows the pitcher to, in effect, pull down on the ball, okay, as it's being released. Uh, and the friction allows it to be pulled down without slipping. If you slip, if the fingers slip along the surface of the ball, uh, you're, it's going to reduce the spin considerably. And so the sticky stuff uh, increases what is called the coefficient of friction, another technical term. Um, but basically, that's the idea. It, it allows that pitcher to be able to pull down harder without slipping. Uh, so you get more spin on the ball and therefore more movement on the ball and therefore swing and a miss. Can I, can I ask a question? Uh, I, I understand the, the substance causing the extra friction, giving them more ability to grip the ball and, and put the spin on it. On a, on a four seam fastball, uh, when they're doing that, does the extra spin give them any extra miles per hour? Or is it all just about the movement of the ball? Uh, it's primarily about the movement. Uh, it, it, interestingly, it's interesting you asked that question. I just saw some postings today on Twitter. Uh, so in the last week or a couple of weeks, uh, spin rates have gone down. Uh, but uh, the speed of forcing vegetables has not gone down. They're more or less independent quantities. So the, you know, the it's really the forward motion of the arm that is giving the pitch the speed. It's the pulling down with the fingers. It's really a separate thing altogether that is primarily giving it the spin. So you, they're, they're not totally independent of each other, but they're sort of independent of each other. What, what is the conflict? Uh, because I know from coaching back in ancient days before spin rate was, I guess, even measurable, let alone something that was discussed, you taught to hold the fastball pretty lightly because you wanted to minimize the drag on the ball. You wanted to release it with as less as little friction as possible. Whereas you held, uh, you held your uh, change up tightly so that with the same arm motion, you would have less spin. How does that conflict with using the gunk to, to get spin? Does, it, does that actually in some ways harm velocity? I don't think so. Uh, you, you mean, does the, does the sticky stuff of, uh, reduce the speed? Is that what you're asking? By creating more friction, yeah. No, I, I, I don't. I don't I'm, I, of course, unless it were so sticky that it just never left your hand. <laughs> that, would be, that would be an extreme case, of course. No, I, I mean, my, 
my picture of what's going on is sort of what I just explained that it that really the arms so as the ball is released certainly the the pitcher is giving the there are really two different motions of the of the fingers that are remaining on the ball okay one is the downward pull I'm talking fastballs now the downward pull to give it the spin but there's also a forward push and when with the circle change uh, you're uh, you're effectively eliminating that forward that extra forward push I mean most of the speed comes from the arm speed most of the speed of the pitch, but you are giving it an extra push forward with the fingers at the end for a fastball, but not for a changeup. You grip the ball in such a way that you don't do that. So that way you can have the same arm speed, but a slower uh, release speed. Have you got an idea how much goop makes a difference in a spin rate, 10, 20, 30 percent? Yeah, I, I, I really don't. I, I suspect you don't need very much. What what really matters is the properties of the stuff they're putting on. I don't think it needs to be a lot. Uh, I mean, if I were advising a pitcher on how to how to do this, I would say just a very thin layer uh, is really all you need because your fingers are not covering the whole ball. They're just, you know, they're, they're, they're just covering a very small part of it. So you don't need, it doesn't need to be sticking up so that you, you know, anyone can see it. <laughs> and yeah. so the, the, a thin layer is all that's needed and anything more than a thin layer, I don't think uh, not only does it not help you, but that makes it more obvious that you're doing it. Uh, can, can we go even, even more old school? Because when, when the sticky tack stuff first came up, I was picturing guys slopping goop onto the ball and, and grabbing it much like uh how people would use the spitball back in the day. How does how does the spitball differ from from what pitchers are doing with this spider sack? Right. So the, the spitball is there. There are two different effects of a spitball, and it's never been exactly clear to me which of those two effects is the dominant effect. So one effect of the spitball is, as you say, you put a glop of something on the ball. And uh, what is well known is that whenever the ball, you know, whenever there's some something sticking up from the surface of the ball, whether it's the seams or saliva, a glop of, stuff of that, or uh, even the scuff mark can actually affect the movement of the ball in sort of unexpected ways. Uh, it, of course, nowadays, there, remember I mentioned that the spin axis largely determines the direction of the movement. And it's not quite right because the seams also play a role. And one of the buzzwords around these days is seam shifted weight. Uh, so one, of, one effect of having some foreign substance really sticking up from the surface of the ball is the potential for having it move in some unexpected way, or certainly unexpected by the batter. It becomes a knuckleball with shorts. Say it again? It becomes kind of like a knuckleball then, in that sense. In a way, that's right. Yeah, the seam shifted wake is really, it, it, the physics behind that is really the same as the physics behind a knuckleball. With a knuckleball, you know, the seams are, are always have more or less the same orientation since the ball is not spinning, so you really can have a big effect. And when the ball is spinning, um, the, the whole secret behind the so-called seam shifted wake is to find some orientation of the ball so that seams kind of show up more or less on the same side of the ball, even though it's spinning. And so it's a, a little bit of trick to learning how to do that. But let me go on to the second thing. The second okay. thing, the second reason for the saliva on the ball is actually quite the opposite of putting the sticky stuff. It's to reduce the amount of friction so that the, uh, so for example, if you want a ball that's low in the zone uh, and still thrown pretty hard, you would do something like throw a split finger fastball. So you can throw a split finger fastball, you know, not as hard as a four seamer, but pretty hard. And the whole idea of the split finger is to reduce the amount of backspin on the ball so the ball doesn't uh, have an upward movement as much. So it actually drops more. 
And I think the one of the effects of the spitball was uh, to provide lubrication to reduce the friction so there's less backspin on the ball and it therefore drops more, or certainly more than the batter expects. You know, the batter, to the extent that, uh, you know, he can sort of see the ball leave the hands and sort of predict where it's going to go, uh, you, you know, if, if, if the spin rate is lower than he expects th for, that, for that amount of speed, then, uh, you know, he's going to swing over. Do, do you buy what uh, some, many of the pitchers are, are saying that we just can't grip the ball without this, this stuff? And, and, I, and I ask that because none of them grew up with this kind of cheating. From, from little league through teen years, high school, college, they didn't do it not necessarily because they were ethical or their coaches were, but because you couldn't. You didn't, you didn't change the ball every batter or even every inning. You took the ball, you tossed it back on the mound for, for the next guy to use. Uh, when I was coaching, we played through Southwest Ohio when I was playing. It was our responsibility to bring three balls to the game. <laughs> that was it. You know, if, if, if two of them got lost in the woods, you had to break out another one. But they, were, they weren't even rubbed down by Delaware River bottom line. Do, do you believe they really, and, and they were fine. They didn't hit batters any more than the, the hit batters uh, in the majors, which incidentally, it's something I saw trying to research is hit batters grew through the sticky stuff thing, according to a, an article in Fangraphs, greatly many more hit batters in 2019 than in previous years, for example. But anyhow, do, do you buy that they can't grip it or, or do you think they're just looking for an excuse? Well, I, you know, I can only tell you what they've told me. And to me, it makes sense. And so here's what they tell me. They tell me, especially on a cold, dry day. Uh, well, so uh, under normal circumstances, under normal circumstances, the ball is mudded up. That already gives you some amount of friction. Um, but then what happens is the pitcher uses the rosin bag and that rosin bag mixes with the perspiration on his hands to give you sort of a naturally sticky substance that, that uh, you know, for time in memoriam, that's how pitchers got a good grip of the ball. But on a cold or especially dry day, there's no perspiration on the hands. And so the ball really starts to feel really, really slick as a result of that. And it's been known for a long time now that pitchers would use foreign substances. You know, typically it was some kind of sunscreen. There are various kinds that some pitchers swear by certain kinds and others by other kinds, where you mix the sunscreen with the rosin and that provides this sticky stickiness. And to, some, to a large extent, it's been tolerated by everybody because, you know, if a guy is going to be throwing a 95 mile per hour fastball, you'd like to think he's got some control over it. Um, because the batter sitting there like a live target. So ev everyone has sort of tolerated it, as long as you kind of weren't too obvious about how you're doing it. But uh, in the last, I, I, I don't know when this thing with the spider pack and other really sticky things began, but uh, I haven't really tried to track that. But somewhere along the way, people started to use this really, really sticky stuff. And then the spin rates really started to go up. Uh, and that's sort of where we are, that uh, people have, people who study these things have looked at the data and, uh, you know, I, 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 guess, I guess one of the primary issues is the fact that the number of uh, plate appearances ending in a strikeout has gone up a lot. It's been going up now for, I don't know, seven or eight years and so pretty steadily. Um, and uh, as you mentioned earlier, three true outcomes, uh, you know, walks, strikeouts, home runs, all result in balls that are not put in play. And that, to a lot of fans, and I count myself as one of those fans, that Very makes fan. it less interesting. <laughs> I mean, you know, I, you know I, w when I see great fielding plays, I, you know, I stand up and applaud, even if it's not my team that's doing it. Uh, you know, you, you just have to appreciate the athleticism that that uh, professional players have. 
And it, the game simply becomes, to me, and I think to a lot of fans, and I think to Major League Baseball, the management, it becomes a lot less interesting when, when basically the game is dominated by home runs and strikeouts. It's, do you think that, that this enforcement, the new enforcement, is, is going to make a major difference, that it, it's going to reduce spin rates, obviously some, but probably not a heck of a lot. Uh, I looked at uh, scoring, just very, very small sample size here. The total runs yesterday were fewer than the Tuesday before, which is in turn fewer than the Tuesday before, which was before they announced they were going to do this. So do you think this is really going to have an effect on, on what happens in the game? Um, that's a, it's an interesting question. And um, so uh, let me give you some numbers here. Uh, well, maybe not exactly numbers, uh, but uh, if you look, if you start tracking uh, spin rates, and I've been tracking them now ever since this whole thing began. Uh, I see, I'm just looking at it right now uh, on a different screen, and I see that spin rates through Monday or through, through, through the weekend games have dropped on a four seam fastball, have dropped about uh, 100 RPM, uh, maybe a little even more than that. Uh, Hmm. Yeah, about a hundred RPM, so which is maybe five uh, percent drop, and so I, I, I'm guessing that that is going to result in movements on pitches decreasing by uh, in, somewhere between a half an inch and an inch. Now, does that matter? Uh, it's a little, uh, it's a little hard to say whether. It, I mean, it's going to matter to some extent. It doesn't seem like a, a whole lot extra movement that, you know, one inch. Um, but, you know, baseball is a game of inches. You know, you look at if, 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 if the fastball, uh, uh, if the, the amount of drop on the pitch is, you know, an inch different. And, you know, there's not a lot of inches to play with. You, you know, you get the diameter of the bat, which is maybe two and five eighths inches. The diameter of the ball is a little less than three inches. So you don't have a lot of inches to play with there. And so balls that maybe would have been swung and missed or maybe fouled off, maybe uh, would be more uh, uh, squared up than they were before. So, so these things matter. And especially, oh, I would, quite frankly, I would not expect to see an effect, oh, you know, over one day. <laughs> I mean, the fact that runs are, you know, offense is, you know, up a little bit or down a little bit on any given day, I think sure. you, know, you really do need a lot of data before, I think, before you start to see these effects. And quite frankly, I would argue that a lot of the analysis that I've seen uh, looking at the effects of higher spin or lower spin as in the last couple of weeks, in a way, I think it's a little premature. Again, this is my own opinion, but I, I think you really need to, I personally think you need probably a lot of data before you start to see the effects. But again, that's my own opinion. Can you have Do we, I, let me ask one real quick, actually. Uh, you know, there's so much focus for the batters now on launch angle. Uh, we've, we've gotten away from, you know, poking those base hits or even just going for the solid line drive. We're, we're looking at launch angle. It seems to me, and again, I know nothing about any of this, uh, but it seems to me that if the ball is dropping uh, an inch less than usual or, or rising an inch less, uh, that maybe we can get out of this uh, home run or bust mentality and, and start squaring up because it sounds like you know, if you if you take away that inch, you're going to get the barrel of the bat a bit more. As you were saying, you're less likely to foul off some of the pitches and get more of the barrel on them. Do we think that a, a reduction in spin rate could cause batters to uh, stop a, at least a little bit that focus on launch angle? Or is that just a mentality completely separate, do you think, from from what the pitchers are doing to alter the game? That's a good question. Uh, I, I don't have a scientific answer. Uh, I, I, you know, as a, as a fan of the game, 
I think they're really separate issues. I think the the uh, the fact that batters are altering their swings to get a uh, a more optimum launch angle for for hitting the long fly balls. I think I I personally think that it's due to the to the uh, massive shifting that goes on in baseball. So with the shifting, you know, the ball that might have been nicely squared up uh, with a low launch, you know, hit hard with a low launch angle and, uh, you know, a, a, a line drive over the infield that drops in front of the outfielder for a base hit or maybe in the gap for a double, um, that when you have the second baseman playing on the outfield grass for, a, you know, a left-handed hitter, you, basically it takes that away. So if, if, if they're taking away the kind of hard contact, low line drive hit, you might as well go for the fences. And I, I, I so I personally think that the, that the so-called launch angle revolution is, I think is driven by, by the shifting. Totally you know, reading, agree. Re reading your stuff about backspin on batted balls, uh, you know, we think of launch angle as the, the batter is swinging up at a 23 degree angle, which means he's got almost no time in the plane of the ball coming in. But it almost seems, because you're saying quite, I don't know why I didn't think of it before, that backspin as, as well, exit velocity plus backspin is what makes the ball go long, long ways. So really, is it better for the batter to swing at a normal angle? I think 5% is what Ted Williams advised, and I'll take his advice. Uh, and aim for slightly under the oh, yeah, Red Sox fan, of course. <laughs> to aim slightly under the center of the ball rather than the you know, normal swing, slightly under the center, so you get the maximization of the exit velocity and the backspin. Does that make any sense at all? Yeah, no, absolutely makes sense. So, um, so there's. Yeah, so if you look at Williams' book, The Science of Hitting, and he he talks about having a slightly upward uh, uh, swing plane that more or less matches the downward plane of the baseball, just dropping largely from gravity, so that if you mistime the swing, then you can still make good contact as opposed to here's the ball coming in and you're swinging at an uppercut. There's only a very small region where you, uh, in, in space and therefore in time where where uh, you can get a good squared up collision. So what, what can you say about that? Uh, if, if you're, certainly if your goal in life is to try to get on base as often as possible, uh, I, I think you would follow William's advice and sw uh, 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 because I think uh, to a large extent, most mishit baseballs are a lot, certainly a, a good fraction of them are due to mistiming. You're, you know, a little behind, a little in front. Uh, but if you can be behind or in front and still make good contact, uh, you know, that, that's definitely a good thing. But yeah, I, I, yeah, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. I see the clock ticking up there. We better take the break very quickly and come back to the baseball and what you think yeah. should be done in the game of baseball to get it back to lots of adventure. Well, let's actually, uh, what we'll do here is we'll, we'll take a break um, and, uh, we will come back. We'll talk about what can be done with the baseball. Uh, it's so great having you here, Alan. It's, it's, it's amazing. And I think we can all agree that what we've learned so far is uh, batted balls in play, fielders making great plays is great. And the other thing we can certainly agree on is that the Yankees suck. Uh, <laughs> I, I think that's fair. So uh, stick with us. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Stick with us and uh, we will be right back on sharing socks. 